The National Museum of Ireland is the guardian of the nation's treasure. At the Museum of Archaeology and History in Dublin's Kildare Street, you'll find artefacts from 7000 BC to the 20th century, outstanding examples of Celtic and medieval art, and the finest collection of prehistoric gold artefacts in Europe. Nearby, in the Museum of Natural History, are gathered specimens of Ireland's wildlife, creatures of the earth, air and water. West along the Liffey, the former Collins Barracks, extensively refurbished, is dedicated to decorative arts and history, focused on weaponry, furniture, costumes, silver, ceramics and glassware. Now, in the latest deployment of the National Museum's resources, the National Folklife Collection goes on display at the Museum of Country Life in Castlebar, County Mayo. Turlock Park, built by the Fitzgerald family, stands on the site of an ancient castle of the De Burgos. The National Museum is, in a sense, the guardian also of the memory of the Irish people. In the museum's other premises, we can survey the grandeur of things, the achievements of high art, the elements of a larger history. Here, in this 21st century building, we can take stock of our rural ancestors by immersing ourselves in their daily lives. The poet Patrick Kavanagh said, ordinary things have lovely wings, and it is our hope that your imagination too will take flight in this encounter with the past. Until very recent times, the story of much of this island was rural, pastoral and poor. There were the rudiments of an urban lifestyle which only truly began to flower in the 19th century. There was some manufacturing, many finished goods were imported, but life for the majority of Irish people up into living memory was bound to the land, to the cycle of the seasons, to grinding toil, to relative poverty. Poor in resources, the people were forced to a minute scrutiny of the materials available to them. A musician can conjure a tune out of empty air. A poet can weave an epic landscape from a handful of words. The human imagination is surprisingly resourceful when asked to deal with basic rudimentary materials. The people whose handiwork we see here are, for the most part, dead and gone. Gone, as our grandmothers would say, to their eternal reward. Some of them were considerable craftsmen and women, but they had no thought of themselves as artists. They worked in an inherited tradition, employing and passing on the simple techniques they had themselves learned from some other anonymous soul. Life was hard, and wrestling a living from the inhospitable world was a serious business people pooled what skills and resources they had for the benefit of the community. We shouldn't romanticize this. Where we may see beauty now, they saw simple necessity. Where we see community spirit as a kind of generosity, these people saw simply those among whom they lived, neighbors, relations and family, all dependent on each other. For centuries, skills were passed on from one anonymous craftsman to another. Men taught each other the skills they had learned from other men. Equally, in their own chain of transmission, women passed on the skills of the hearth, of weaving and spinning. Ireland's earliest inhabitants were coastal dwellers drawing sustenance from shellfish, edible seaweeds, the fish that teemed in the rivers and seas. Seaweed nourished the thin soils, and the need for boats bred a group of rare craftsmen, the curragh builders. The curragh is no more than a light, frail shell, originally simple cowhide stretched over a frame of laths or light rods. The form reached its most developed expression in the Kerry Navog, a form still admired by men like Michael O'Leary in Brandon today. 
A man named Hartney came south from Clare around 1830 to teach the Kerry boatmakers the art of wrapping the light frame in canvas using tar to make it waterproof. The skill went north as well as south along the coast to men like Mikey Connealy from Inishir, filmed as recently as 1966 by staff of the National Museum at work on the making of a curragh. His tools were simple, his method of steaming the timbers as primitive as it was effective. But like Michael O'Leary in Kerry today, Connealy was working to produce a form already perfected in the memory of the folk, a kind of spare and sufficient enduring technology. Many contemporary curragues are built for racing, not for carrying people and fish and livestock and turf, as was once the case. But it still lifts the heart to see one fly across the water. The curragh is a kind of basket to carry men on the sea, and basket work is one of the forms in which folk artefacts find their highest expression. When you move in the world of work and food and shelter, there is always a need for containers, something to carry fish or turf or potatoes or seaweed in. And what better than a basket? A modern basket maker like Joe Shanahan, seen here with his brother Michael, is producing useful goods for a luxury market. The Shanahans of Carrick on Shore made baskets for household use, for the railways, for fishermen, and they maintained the tradition for generations, almost up to the present day. Joe is working on a herring cran, a basket which functioned as a measure for quantities of what was once a staple part of the Irish diet. The Shanahans usually worked with willow rods. When Michael O'Malley of Inish Turk County Mayo was filmed making this lobster pot from a heather bush, he was following a shape that had evolved over generations, though it takes a particular sense of ingenuity to look at a bush and see the pot it can become. The lobster fishermen, incidentally, preferred heather to willow rods for their pots, as the heather does not mask the smell of the bait in the pot. This potato sieve is a perfect illustration of the adage that form must follow function. The wonder to us is that the forms were maintained, they evolved slowly, had a particular local identity, but were everywhere more or less the same, perfectly adapted to the work. We still say in Ireland that somebody is handy, that such and such a fellow can turn his hand to anything. These terms suggest something quite profound, that the things of the world, the raw things of the world, can be coaxed or shaped by human hand to produce desirable objects, desirable results, without benefit of blueprint or drawing. There is a word in Arabic, baraka, meaning blessed. It refers to the grace or blessedness things take on from years of careful and respectful use. It suggests that something of the life force, the personal energy of the man or woman who made or used a thing, can pass into the thing itself. The things that men and women use daily, incorporate into their lives, are a special kind of human record. Memory lives in them, not just the prompted memory of types and forms, but also the actual memories of the men and women themselves. The word baraka ripples out to suggest something of the quality of the place and society in which things are made and used, something of the natural world which supplied the materials, something of the abstract skill and thought which went into making the artefact. Often the craft and skills and methods that took root in a district were influenced by the simple presence of raw materials. Reed from the wetlands makes a water repellent roof so that reed thatching is common in and near river valleys and marshes. 
Matty Kelly cuts his reeds every year from December to mid-March when the sap has died back, as his family have done for generations. Matty harvests his reeds on the banks of the River Shore. Using much the same methods, but a different material, straw, Jim Burke has been thatching for many years in Wexford using straw from the corn harvest. The truth of our modern world, of course, is that work needs time, and time is money. One reason why otherwise sustainable craft traditions are dying out is that few can now afford to pay for the craftsman's time, and what was once the everyday has become a luxury. Nevertheless, many dedicated people in our own time are taking up these crafts again. Folk life, it is obvious, endures only where there is a folk, a community capable of drawing on a tradition of craft skill, needing its products, valuing its makers. When the legendary Bernard Mongan travelled the country making buckets and basins, mugs, jugs and canisters, his were practically the only vessels available to the householders in the districts he visited. Now plastic is everywhere, and who would wait months for the tinker on his travels to replace a bucket when the alternative is a few minutes' drive away? It is equally true to say that post-independence Ireland, an Ireland of smallholders as opposed to tenant farmers and labourers, of growing numbers of industrial workers, of expanding towns and cities, became a country in flight not just from poverty, but from the webs of kinship and custom that sustained the folk traditions and nurtured the folk imagination. We should avoid sentimentality. Annie Corrigan's grandmothers would have carded wool like this, would have worked from dawn to dusk, year in, year out, to feed their families, to put clothes on their backs, pamputis on their feet. These straw head rings are attractive objects, but to the women who wore them to help in the carrying of heavy loads, there were practical necessities in a world of hard work. burden rope, used for carrying heavy, awkward loads, took skill and ingenuity to make, as did the basket, but their use was in a world of unremitting labour. When the scythe began to be widely used in 18th century Ireland, having been introduced by migrant labourers returning from Scotland, it replaced the bill hook a tool in use in Ireland since the Bronze Age, a back-breaking implement used mainly by women to do the harvesting. The scythe, then the horse-drawn harvester, followed in its turn by the combine, displaced not only a practice and a lore that was more than 2,000 years old, it also displaced women to the margins of harvesting. These straw hens' nests were made by men when the harvest was over. The keeping of hens was women's work. In general, women worked close to the home, tending to food and clothing, to the smaller domestic creatures, nurturing children. Men worked the land or toiled on the sea, and the division of labour was often reflected in the very artefacts themselves. These things are never simple, of course, and there is documentation to suggest that in many areas, women did much the same work as men. In any case, they worked equally hard at the thankless tasks of making a living. Making a living could be a curious business. This precious piece of film from the National Museum's archive shows men engaged in an arcane art conjuring turf for the burning out of mud slurry. In its own way, 
This extraordinary process sums up a terrible truth about our past. Our ancestors, for the most part, endured lives of a bareness and poverty we can scarcely imagine. It was their triumph, though, to conjure marvels from the scantiest and poorest of materials, in this case, ultimately, fire from mud. They found time, too, for the dearest human accomplishment of all, the ability to celebrate. Significantly, of all the traditions, this is the one that still lives on. They made Bridget's crosses from woven reeds and rushes to celebrate the great goddess of fertility in her Christian incarnation as Saint Breed. They made masks for mumming, for dancing and celebration, acts of defiance against the oncoming winter, acts of remembering as the masked musicians and dancers acted out the memory of the tribe. They amused themselves and each other. Most people were no better or worse than we are today, but among them were ingenious, humane and creative people. Here, in Turlock Park, in the artefacts that immortalise their work, they live on, they endure.